you are here for a leader spiritual formation. And what we did is we gave it that title. And basically, uh, we're going to throw a party for you guys. And we gave it that title so there wouldn't be a lot of people here. You know, only the holy ones. The ones that want to get really in deep with God. That's, that's why we gave it that title. I am excited that you are here and, and just to be able to share with you. My name is Dan Garza. I'm from Sacramento. I don't hate you for trying to take my kings. Um, but it is such a privilege to be here and just share with you something that's just really um, just close to my heart. Uh, and just in talking with the other leaders that have shared, it was just so interesting to all of us how, okay, so I know Brent here, and that's about it. Like, I don't know anybody else. Like, I'm in Northern California, and, and Brent just kind of said, you know what, just speak what God has placed in your heart for, for our district and, and our children's leaders. And it was interesting just hearing since, since the beginning of this conference how there's that just that interwoven thing that has to do with your interior life, with your spiritual walk and that intimacy that you have with God. And it, it's even shocking just how God just works and how we're going to be sharing some of uh, the same verses that we've we've heard, and you know, we learned in in Bible school this that if God says something to you once, you need to pay attention. But if He keeps on repeating it, it's something that you really need to pay attention to. Okay, so what we're going to talk about this uh, afternoon in the next uh, forty minutes, and hopefully, I won't do too much talking because I don't know how your other labs have gone, but I really would like for you to have some time to interact with, with each other and with myself, and maybe we can um, take some steps towards just that intimacy that God desires for us. And so what we're talking about is the fusion between doing and becoming. Now, if there is a scene that's embedded itself in my mind over the last three years where God's just been really pulling at my heart and, and, and taking me in, it's that scene that was shared to us in the morning uh, by Damon, and that's in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. And I think we have some slides of those, some of those verses, but I want us to just look at that because I want to pick up where um, we left off this morning with this passage and maybe even give you some practical tools to uh, find yourself becoming and doing as Christ would like you to do. It says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to the village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. And I know we had a different version this morning, but I like that word, distracted, by all the preparations that had to be made. And she came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care about my, that my sister has left me to do the work by myself. And he says, tell her to help me. And then Jesus responds the next slide. And he's kind of like, Martha, Martha, Martha. You know? And he says, can we go to the next slide? He says, Martha, the Lord answers, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. And Mary has chosen what is better. And so that phrase right there, Mary has chosen what is better. It's something that we need to key in on this afternoon as we talk about how you and I are leaders in the kingdom of God and what he intends for us in order for us to impact people's lives, children's lives, parents' lives. And what this passage does for me is it speaks about the balance uh, that the spirit of God brings when we submit to his leading, when we, you're going to hear me say this, when we cooperate with the Spirit of God. And why do we say cooperate? Because in regards to spiritual formation, uh, there's nothing that you and I could really do. It really is about what the Spirit wants to do in us, for us, through us, right? And so the only thing that we really have as humans in the process of spiritual formation is our will. To cooperate with the Spirit, the leading of the Spirit, and go in the direction that the Spirit wants to take us. And let's be honest, sometimes when we get down to true spiritual formation, uh, it's not a very pretty road. 
that God has a way of taking us down that path that is going to stretch us, is going to mold us. Is that not true? But it's also the path that leads to success. And one of the things that I'm going to challenge you to do this afternoon is perhaps change your definition of success. But before we get there, let's look at this passage and see if we can't maybe uh, identify some things that are particular to uh, Mary and are particular to Martha. So we can go to the next slide. The first thing we observe from this passage is the need to sit at the feet of Jesus. And when I refer to Mary, I'm referring to Mary as the becomer. Someone who is taking the time to intentionally sit at the feet of Jesus. And when we talk about Martha, we're talking about the doer. Now, the passage finds two women that have received the visit from their Lord. And one opts to serve him and the other one opts to make all the preparations uh, in, in, in that manner. Serve Jesus. Now both are important. Mary represents that individual or that side of us that longs to sit at the feet of Jesus and be in his presence and become enamored with him. Haven't you ever had that uh, feeling inside where you just don't want to do anything? And I'm not talking about that Sunday morning feeling when you don't want to show up to class. I'm talking about just that time where, man, I just wish I could just do nothing. Any of you ever had that feeling where you just say, I just don't want to do anything. What do you want to do? I don't even want to put music on. I just, can I just sit here and just be in God's presence? That's Mary. And I'm hoping that we can be a little bit more like Mary, or at least uh, let the Spirit give us the desire, if you will, to be a little bit more like Mary. Now, Martha represents that side of us, and we've been talking a lot throughout this conference, that represents that side that wants to do all that we can for him. And I'll tell you right off the bat, there's something that I was mentored with uh, early in ministry. And uh, my mentor said this, Dan, you need to be careful because ministry can become an idol. Ministry can become an idol. The need to constantly be doing becomes a self-gratifying action instead of a God-glorifying ministry. And so we need to be careful with that because oftentimes we get caught up we are that person that wants to do all we can. Now, I'll tell you that neither of these are necessarily or inherently wrong, but each can quickly become a hindrance if there is no balance. And so I'm not pursuing one in favor of the other. What I'm suggesting to you is that if we're going to cooperate with the Spirit, the Spirit will want to balance both the becoming and the doing of who we are as leaders or as believers in God's kingdom. Can you imagine favoring one over the other? Well, it's easy to understand the doing part because the doing, we are all doing. We all have to meet deadlines. We're all scheduling. We're uh, putting programs in place. Okay, Christmas season, very busy for you guys as children's leaders. I get that. We're doing a lot, you know. But what often happens is we forget to just sit at the feet of Jesus. And so I hope that that really is cemented in your heart this afternoon and throughout this conference. The need to just sit at the feet of Jesus. Now, this unbalanced life, okay, it, it is so often our spiritual life is dichotomized, isn't it? It's divided into two sections. Okay, this is my ministry aspect and this is my spiritual life. I hear that often in leadership. Well, no, 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 this is ministry, but then this is... This is how I get recharged. This is how God, and we tend to divide that just even in the way that we speak. But I'm suggesting to you that this passage does not imply one over the other. Sitting or attending to the preparations is to be neglected in favor of the other. Rather, what we can glean from this passage is that we need to cooperate so that the Spirit can bring balance. So if we look at this, we continue to see that Martha... Always doing something that she never takes the time to become like Christ. You may even say that you are too busy to uh, take the time to be with Jesus. I know that's often the case for me, if we're going to be honest. And part of being spiritually transformed. And if you're looking for um, a definition or uh, a way that you can uh, articulate spiritual formation, I would just simply have adopted Mulholland's, Robert Mulholland's. Uh, definition to be transformed into the image of Christ 
for the sake of others. I really love how he nailed that. To be transformed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. And that's interesting to me because we are to be more and more like Jesus, but it's not for ourselves. It's not so we can become some spiritual rock stars, hello? It's so that we can be a benefit, a blessing, so that we can serve other people. And so when I talk about spiritual formation, I'm talking about being transformed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. And by the way, I, when I speak to you this afternoon, I do so with the following two assumptions. Number one, uh, I assume that you already know the stuff that I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, I hope that you already know the stuff that I'm talking about. Because here's my second assumption. My second assumption is that you practice what you believe, not necessarily what you know. You practice what you believe, not necessarily what you know. Let me give you a good example of that, okay? Because we're all leaders here, I can talk about it. Tithing. We all know, all right, everybody, how, how much more benefit could the children's ministry have if everybody in the church believed in tithing? They know it, but they don't necessarily practice. Why? Because you practice what that which you believe. And so in regards to that, when we look at Martha, we're just kind of busy doing our own thing. That's kind of how I relate to Martha uh, for our own benefit oftentimes for our own benefit, that we negate our cooperation with the Spirit to become more and more like Christ. We may even say that we're too busy doing things for Jesus. After all, someone has to, right? Someone has to pour the juice in the cup. Someone has to get the crackers ready. Somebody's got to change the diapers. Uh, you know, and, and that's me as a senior pastor. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. There's a lot of things that go on in doing things for Jesus. And to be a Martha is to find your self-worth. And here is kind of the danger that I would caution you against is that to be a Martha is to find self-worth in what we do rather than what we've allowed the Spirit to make of us. See, we always fall into that trap. If you want to go further into this, the temptation of Jesus. Where Satan tempted Jesus in three different ways. And I want to tell you something, you are not what you do, you are not what you have, and you are not what people say you are. You are the beloved sons and daughters of Christ. That is who you are. And so we fall into this trap of thinking, well, I am what I do. And Dr. Goodell talked a little bit about that towards the end. And that's the trap that we fall into in constantly doing things for Jesus. Now, to be a Mary is to be someone who is looking for opportunities to be in God's presence. This is the person who understands that it is better to, do, to be than it is to do. It is better to sit at the feet of Jesus than to attend the daily tasks. Mary is the one who has understood that what she does will have more significance because of the time that she has spent sitting at the feet of Jesus. Haven't you ever wanted to multiply what you do? Boy, if I could just have two more hands. If I could have just a couple more volunteers. If I could just be twice as effective. Well, there's a way that you can do that. It's by taking the time to become like Christ. And that can only take place by cooperating with the Spirit at the feet of Jesus. Now again, this is not to ne negate or neglect one in favor of the other. But let me suggest to you, I think we have to go to the next slide. Uh, spiritual formation, there is the definition in case you wanted to get that. Being transformed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. Robert Mulholland, anyone familiar with Robert Mulholland's work? If not, that's another one of those books, that any one of his books, Invitation to a Journey. Excellent book, it talks to you about the journey to the inside, the interior life, your spiritual life. Okay, And then we cooperate with the Spirit through the disciplines. So my question to you is, as leaders, when do you give time for God to do that? Let me suggest to you that what God knows is best is not something that should be taken lightly. How do you know if you've given yourself over intentionally to 
what God wants to make of you. Look at your Google Calendar. Very quick application, right? Open up your, fo- your, your phone. You look down your agenda for the month, okay? We have everything else scheduled into that. And oftentimes, what's missing? Our time with God. And yet, that is paramount. That is the most important aspect of who you are. So I'm just curious, does anyone, any one of you schedule in your time with God? And like you put it in your calendar? Like you're like, I'm this, no, don't bother me, this is my time. Anyone? Let me suggest to do that. So as a pastor, you know, we're, I'm a lead pastor there in Sacramento, and so my schedule is, is crazy. Two kids in soccer, a third one that I take care of in the morning, my wife works till six. Uh, you know, it's so just really hectic schedule. You get it. You're children's leaders. You know what I'm talking about. So one of the things that I had to quickly learn to do is to schedule in my time with God. In other words, be very intentional. Now, you can do it very early in the morning. You can do it late at night. You can do it during the afternoon, whatever the case may be. One of the things that I had to do is I set a time every day from 2.30 to 4.30 where I was just at the altar before God. Just doing it. I scheduled it in. And my secretary knew somebody would come to the office. She knew not to schedule them in. I remember when I first started doing this, because it was very difficult, because I wanted, well, people would come and say, Pastor, I need your help. And we'll get to that in a minute. And I wanted to stop what I was doing and attend to them. But I got into this habit because I understood this principle. And I said, from 2.30 to 4.30, I don't do anything. That's my time with God. I remember one lady, she was so persistent. Because we can have some persistent parents, right? Hello? It's okay to say, hey man, come on. They're not here. You can even say, you can even roll your eyes if you want to. This is relaxed, all right? The lady was so persistent, she went to the altar where I was in church. She literally tapped on my shoulder. Pastor, I need you right now. And your secretary just told me that, I, that, you're, that you don't have time for me right now. Um, I will have time for you at 4.30. But I need you right now. And don't you ever feel like this? I feel like telling people, yo, your emergency ain't my emergency. Okay? Yeah. Hello? Yeah, come on. I'm just being real. But be honest. And so I just very nicely said to her, Sister so-and-so, uh, I have, this is my time with God. And I can be of greater benefit to you at 4.30. Because right now, I just don't have anything to give you. Oh, okay. And she left. Her emergency all of a sudden wasn't an emergency. She didn't stick around for 4.30, right? She never came back. What am I trying to tell you? We have to be very intentional. We have to build it into our life. It needs to be our lifestyle. Put it, put it in your calendar if that helps you. Or just make a commitment and honor that commitment to continually be in God's presence. And so the question that I pose to you is when do we give uh, God time for that? When do, um, when are we intentional about it? When are we allowing the spirit to work in us? Because as been stated before, being like Christ is no accident, okay? I know people, and you know people, okay, that have gone to church all their lives and they have not matured. Can I get a witness? Amen. Come on, Amen. right? And I'm not talking about kids, I'm talking about adults. They go to church their entire life, Okay, they have the scriptures practically memorized, okay, but yet, they're the same. Why? Because they haven't been intentional about spending intimate quality time with their Savior. And what I'm suggesting to you as leaders of the church, as ministers... God is desiring to spend that time with you because that is the means of grace through which he transforms you. And so, the more you spend time with God, the more you're going to reflect him. Let me give you an example. So, my son, like I told you, I have uh, my son who's nine years old, Evan, Jada, who's six years old, uh, and then I have a two and a half year old, uh, Judah. And I take care of Judah in the mornings. And so, I'm not a Power Ranger guy. Are you guys, like, into Power Rangers? Anyone? Power Rangers? And some of you? I was not into Power Rangers, okay? But our babysitter moved to Florida, and we just made the decision that I was going to take care of him. 
in a matter of months, because he's like Power Ranger fanatic, right? He's like, he could barely talk. He's like, blue, green, yellow, you know? And in a matter of months, I found myself watching Power Rangers. You say, well, what's wrong with that? My son was asleep. <laughs> and I turned on the TV and was like, oh, I missed this episode. Boom, you know, DVR, yay. And, and, you know, I found myself, you know, okay, uh, the Barracuda Blade. <laughs> you know, like, Barracuda Blade, where'd that come from? And I spent enough time with my son to start what? Imitating him. Let me give you another example. So, just like he got me into Power Rangers, I got him into Dog Whisperer. <laughs> By that I mean, we have a German short-haired pointer who's now 10 months and is like this. <laughs> and so we're training him. And I say we because my son Judah now has begun to help. And so we're sitting, you know, there in, the, in our living room. Heal! Heal! Boom. After a few months, smart dog starts healing. Sit, sit, shake, shake, you know. A hundred dollars, he'll go and fetch. No, it's a wish, right? <laughs> well, my wife comes home, and she's trying to talk to Granite, our German short hair plant. Hey, Granite, sit. Dog's here. <laughs> right? And then she calls my oldest son, and she says, Evan, get Granite out of the kitchen. And Evan's sitting there. Granted, heal. Just sits there. My wife goes, Judah? Kick, because I'm not there. Kick Granite out of the kitchen. And my little two and a half year old's like, hey, heal. <laughs> Can't even understand what he's saying. And there's Granite, the German short hair pointing, pops up, leaves the kitchen, and goes and sits in front of my son. So in my house, my wife jokes about this. She's like, we all know who the alpha dog is. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's alpha dog. Yeah. And we all know who's second in charge. Who's second in charge? Judah. Judah. Now, why is Judah second in charge? I mean, you see him. He's not, you know, he's like two and a half. <laughs> you know, he's, he's all legs ahead, and that's it. Oh, you see his little feet. It's so funny when he runs, I chase him, and the dog chases him. He, he runs around and he's like tilted the whole time just to make sure he's can stay ahead. And yet he's second in charge. Why? Because he spent enough time with me to begin to exert my authority over that German short hair pointer. Are you understanding what I'm telling you? The more time that you intentionally spend with your German short no, I'm kidding, with God, <laughs> you'll begin to act in the same authority as God. Hello? And I know as children's ministry leaders, you could use some authority because your kids are coming to you hurt, they're, they're, they're battered around by life, and you need to be able to speak life, and we're going to talk about that tomorrow morning, but you need to do so in the authority that God has given you to speak into their lives. And the only way that you can do that is by spending enough time with the author and the perfecter of your life. The one who can give you the authority to speak and move mountains in people's lives. That's right. So you need to be intentional about it. I remember one, on one occasion I used to be a district youth director for the Hispanic district in uh, Northern California. And our assistant superintendent, I was in my office, he comes frustrated into my office. And he said, I mean, I'm typing away, <coughs> getting ready for uh, one of our uh, summer fests that we had. Comes and sits down and he just plots down, big dude. You know? And he's like, <sighs> and I pop up. Hey, pastor. What can I do for you? He says, Dan, nothing. I just need to sit here for a few minutes. Okay, my office. Okay, cool. Signed the check alone, told me to leave. Uh, and just kind of just sat there. 
him and I were kind of rocking back and forth, a little uncomfortable, you know. And then he says, Dan, I let them get to me. He had just come out of an executive presbyter meeting. Hello. Yeah. And he says, I let them get to me. That means I haven't prayed enough. Gets up, walks away. And that stuck with me. Because right after being a DYD, I took a turnaround church. And boy, our board meetings, I was very frustrated a lot of the times. Oh, you're too young. Oh, you just graduated. Oh, you just want to change the church. I was very frustrated. Okay, I'm very frustrated. Just being vulnerable and honest with you. And I remember the words of my mentor who said, I'm frustrated. That means I didn't pray enough. Now, oftentimes, it's not that people are attacking us. It's just simply we haven't spent enough time with God. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yes. We have not been intentional in doing that. Listen, we invest in work. We invest in school. We invest in relationships. These are not bad things, okay? How many of you guys uh, have tools? I love tools. I love tools. Let me, let, let me be gender sensitive. How many uh, girls? Like Dooney and Burke purse. Okay, no, don't care, Michael Kors. Yeah, okay, you go on. All right, but isn't it interesting? Talking about investment, as a guy, I find myself investing more in tools than I do in devotional books that will enrich me. We buy more of other things than the tools and the equipment that will be used by God to administer his grace to transform me. I think that there is a problem with that. Again, we've dichotomized. We've divided our life into ministry. Oh, this is my... No, God gave you one life, one whole complete life. And he wants to transform you, but you need to be intentional about it. So the question that is pertinent for us is, are we Martha or are we Mary? But let's look at the interior life. I only have a few more minutes. Uh, because I think the example of Jesus, the Christ model, gives us the formula to what we're, how to become cooperative with the Spirit. Now, when we look at the life of Jesus, it's very easy for us to just casually glance over the Gospels and call Jesus' ministry successful on the basis of miracles that he produced, right? Who is Jesus? Oh, he, you know, turned the bread and the fishes, he multiplied them. Oh, you know, he, he calmed the storm, he, he healed, you know, the sick, and he casted out demons. And we tend to associate, which is why I challenge you to redefine your definition of success, and we associate the success of Christ's ministry with the things that he did and not who he was. And I'm telling you, if you want to have a successful ministry, you need to look at it from the context of who you are in Christ. And others will begin to relay that same message about you. At the end of the day, folks, kids don't care, all right, whether your theology is perfect, whether your eschatology is correct, okay? They don't. At the end of the day, they want to know, are you a real person? And you can only be real if you spend time at the feet of Jesus. That's the truth. You are nothing more than what you are before the feet of Jesus. Everything else is fake. Hello? Everything else is false. And it's interesting because Mark's gospel, for instance... I don't think I have a slide for this, but in Mark chapter 1, verse 35, he is very careful to introduce Jesus. And he says, very early in the morning, Jesus got up, hello, and he went to a private place. And what did he do? Oh, there it is. Yeah. Got to a solitary place and he went to go pray. Dr. Goodell talked about, hinted at that. He says, this is very important. But I love this, this phrase. I want to key in on that. It says, he got up and went to a private place. How many of you have a private place? You're like, Dan, you don't know my house. <laughs> okay, I have a 2,400 square foot home, and I continue to tell my wife that we should sell it and buy like a 200 square foot home. Because we are always constantly together. Does that happen to you guys? 
I mean, I have five other rooms, a formal living room, a, a casual living room, a kitchen, a backyard, a front yard, three car, and they're all, my kids always seem to be around me. Hello? And I'm like, babe, I just want a little private space. And what does my wife say? We just want to be with you. And that's great. We need to do that. But the reality is, as leaders, we also need our private time with God. You need that private time. And so subsequently in the gospel narratives, we find that before every miracle, here's, here's what I want to tell you. Before every miracle, you find Jesus away in solitude, away in private, praying. What is he doing? He's charging his batteries up. He's not doing, he is becoming. Are you seeing that? And as believers, we need to come to understand from the example set forth by Jesus, okay, that before every miracle, before our ministry, we need to spend time at the feet of Jesus. We need to spend time in private. We need to grow intimate with God. And let me tell you something, because I'm telling you and I'm trying to convince you that it is our cooperation with the Spirit. That desire is birthed by God. And so, man, let's be honest. Sometimes I just don't feel like it, Pastor. Sometimes I'm just too tired. So that's when you need to change your prayer and say, God, I'm really tired. I need you to give me the desire, the hunger for you. You see how intentional we're being? Why? Because your ministry is dependent upon being transformed into the image of Christ for the sake of others. So we need to be intentional. Now, as believers, we come to understand from the example set forth by Christ that finding time for both prayer and solitude is not an option for us. I guarantee you, you do ministry week after week and you don't retreat into God's presence, you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be, you're going to be speaking that language that creates a negative culture. Hello? You're going to be that punk. Hello? Because of why? Because you haven't spent that quality time in the presence of God. And so of these two disciplines, prayer and solitude, which one do you think is the most elusive for us as believers? Solitude. Why? Reality of it is, is you can say a prayer during rush hour traffic. Y'all have some bad traffic here. I thought LA was bad. No, I'm just being real. I was stuck in it. So Brent, oh, Brent, I'll be there in about 20 minutes. GPS says 18 miles. I'll be there in 20 minutes. Took me an hour. Like, whoa. Um, but we can pray, right? Like, we can find those times in prayer. You know, if you're uh, part of a youth, you know how youth pray, right, at school? They drop their na napkin. Thank you, Jesus, for this food, name it. And they pick it right back up. You know, they don't know where to see it. They're kind of, you know, type prayer. We find times to pray. But how often do you find yourself alone practicing the discipline of solitude? That's really what I want to encourage you. No distraction. No music. No cell phone. Some of you are like, oh, pastor. <laughs> no Twitter account. No Facebook. I tell my congregation, if we spent, put our face in God instead of in a book, Facebook, we'd be a lot better off, right? We tell, uh, tell it all to Jesus, the old hymn said. No, now we tell it all to the world through Facebook and we leave Jesus out. But that's just my thing. Just be careful what you put on Facebook. But we're not very intentional. But Mark states something very interesting. He says that Simon, after having looked for Jesus, he finally finds him. And he says, Jesus... Don't you know that people are looking for you? Come on. Does that not sound like a Sunday morning statement to children's workers all across America? Do you not know that parents are looking for you? I love it. My office is right next to our children's pastor. 
And every Sunday, without fail, I'm sitting there going over some notes and getting everything ready, and there's got to be about 40, 50 kids outside my office door waiting for my kids. Pastor, I love it. I love it. Isn't it true that as leaders we're demanded upon? It, our time is demanded from. And it's interesting, Mark states here, it says that Peter, Simon Peter, goes and finds Jesus who is in a solitude place. And he says, don't you know that people need you? Listen. The fact that people need you means you're special. I want you to know that. The fact that people are demanding of your time means that you're important to the kingdom of God. But people aren't the only ones that are asking of your time. God is asking of your time as well. And it's almost as he's, he's sending his, it is, he's sending his spirit and he's tugging at your heart and he says, don't you know that I want to spend time with you? You know what I love about that, that Mary and, and Martha narrative is that Mary sits at the feet of Jesus. And here's the thing that we often negate in this passage is that Mary sits at the feet of Jesus. What had Jesus just finished doing? He had just finished preaching, teaching, rebuking, casting out demons, and healing. He was doing ministry. And yet he comes into the safety, the refuge of Mary and Martha's house. Let me suggest to you that perhaps it's because Jesus wanted to share some moments with his friends. And Mary was the only one willing to give Jesus what he needed. Hear me out, leader. Jesus allows himself to need your love. He wants to feel it. He wants to feel the warmth of you sitting at his feet. But you have to be intentional about it. Now, these two groups, which one do you think is most important and is often the most neglected? Obviously, it's God. We're so busy doing ministry. I think you can go to the next slide. We're so busy doing ministry that we neglect God. The following which was true of Jesus is true of you and I today. And I want to finish because I want to give you this exercise. The fact that you are needed certainly affirms you're important to somebody. But the results as to whether you're successful in the life that you live is dependent upon the disciplines of the spirit for your life. Evidently, that time in solitude was good for Jesus because immediately after he finishes his solitude, this is, what, this is what Jesus says. He says, let us go somewhere else so that I can also preach. You see that? Okay, I'm ready. I already spent time with God. I'm ready. Now you can demand from me. Now you can withdraw from that which has been deposited in my spirit. Wow. You ever get up on a Sunday and like, do I have to? <laughs> my wife hits me all the time. Of course, you're the pastor. Who's going to preach? <laughs> but sometimes, come on, let's be real. I was like, oh, no, it's the same song. Oh, so and so always comes in with boogers. I hate that. You know, that's the truth. Sometimes we just don't. You know where? Why? Because we haven't spent time at the feet of Jesus. We've allowed circumstances to determine how we feel, instead of allowing the Spirit to transform us for the sake of others. Do you hear me? And so, the public ministry of Christ. Oh, that's a good time. I was going to say, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the public ministry of Christ that included miracles, the teachings, and the confrontations all flowed directly from his time alone. Jesus, let me suggest to you, did not go from miracle to miracle. He went from solitude to solitude. And sandwiched in between were miracles. 
And that's why I'm challenging you to change the formula of how you live life. If you go from prayer to prayer, discipline to discipline, solitude to solitude, that which you live in between will be great, will become greater. Because it's what at the feet of Jesus that you win the success of ministry. So if as believers we are to see the words of Jesus come to pass, when he said, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing and even greater things, then we need to be intentional about spending our time with Jesus. You see, the journey to the interior of our being, it takes us to more than just identifying ourselves. I want you to hear me. But more importantly, it is a course that takes us to discovering a God that is waiting in the depths of our soul. Waiting to be discovered by you. So how do you travel the path of Mary to become like Christ? It is through the disciplines of the Spirit. They are the means through which God administers His grace to transform you into the image of Christ for the sake of others. Prayer, solitude, fellowship. Let me give you a couple other ones. If you're looking for a book that elaborates on this, uh, Brett gave one in his sessions called Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. That is a phenomenal book. You have to get that book. Renovation of the Heart by Dallas Willard. He also writes one, and you may be more familiar with this one. It's called the uh, Spirit's Disciplines, or the, the Disciplines of the Spirit, uh, both by Dallas Willard. And this is what he says of the disciplines. He says, a discipline is an activity within our power that enables us to accomplish what we cannot by direct effort. Cooperate with the Spirit. And he divides those into two. He says there are disciplines of engagement as well as disciplines of abstinence. Let me read to you a couple. Worship, celebration, confession, guidance, fellowship, journaling, meditation, prayer, solitude, silence, fasting, simplicity, chastity, sacrifice, and submission. All these are used by the Spirit to transform you as the leaders. And the more that you are transformed, the more effective and successful you will be. So let's do this. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> Practical suggestions. Be intentional. You heard me say that. Be intentional. Schedule it. Right? Schedule it. Put it on your Google Calendar. But then watch this. Start with a plan, but proceed with his leading. And that's what uh, David was talking about earlier. Oh, we want to do this, and it's a principle, and we got to do this. No, 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 no. Those are principles that we need to. We don't leave them to the side, but we allow the Spirit to use them and place the agenda upon our time in solitude. See? <laughs> what do we want to do? Doers are always, okay, well, I'm going to spend uh, Monday uh, in solitude, and from 9 to 10, I'm going to do this, and from 10 to 11, I want to do that, and, and, and that's fine. But once you get into that moment of solitude, that moment of devotion, that moment of sitting at the feet of Jesus, Jesus is in charge of what he does next. Because sometimes there are areas that are deeply rooted that we have not dealt with and we cover them by the busyness of our life. And you think, well, they don't show up. They do show up. You cast a shadow upon the kids that you minister. You project upon them. That's why this is so important that you are transformed by the Spirit of Christ into His image. And so we need to start with a plan but proceed with His leading. We need to learn to gauge ourselves. It helps avoid frustration and burnout. So guess what I do before every board meeting? I pray up. Hello? I pray up. If I know it's going to be a tough day on Sunday... I pray up. I invest extra time more than the usual to be in God's presence. Hello? The next one says, invest in you. Read, buy material, spend the money to take the time to reset and reboot. Come on. If you own a PC, you know what I'm talking about. All right? 
You don't clean it up every once in a while, defrag it, diz clean up, what happens? Run slow, you know? Let me tell you something. I've even had to force leadership on our team to take sabbaticals. And I don't ask. Take sabbatical. But there's so much to do. Take sabbatical. How long? I'll call you when I need you back. But I get that. Why? Because you're walking around frustrated. You're walking around defeated, discouraged. You haven't spent time at the feet of Jesus. Hear me out? So go to the next slide. Be intentional about practicing. Here's, here's the thing that I, you, I wish we had time to do it here and discuss, but I'm a minute over. Make a list of what's important to you. Next, place a number next to the item to show the level of priority. Okay? Just randomly. Boop, 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 boop. What's important? Family, uh, school, work, you know. And then put, them, put a number next to them. One through whatever. You don't have to make a whole list. Prioritize them. But then make a note next to that number to show how much time you give that. Because you practice what you believe, not what you know. And just like your ledger of a checkbook says where your heart is, your Google Calendar shows what's really important to you. So see if some of you go, oh, God is number one. How much time did you spend with God this week? Two minutes. Just being real. And then work through the disciplines so that if God really is number one in your life, that the time that you spend with him is according to the priority. Amen?